Welcome everybody. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll let a few more folks sign on first. We have muted everybody just to keep the background noise down, but we are going to let people unmute and ask questions after Michelle's presentation. Um, and you're welcome to submit questions into the chat while we're waiting and during Michelle's program. We'll just wait one more minute and then we'll get started. And I, I have, I'll, I'll share my fear for the night, which is that my elderly cat is going to spontaneously try to jump onto my lap at some point in the next hour <laughs> with a lot of claws <laughs> and not much mobility jumping ability these days. So we'll try to keep. It's okay. Everyone always likes a cat appearance. A surprise pet appearance. <laughs> It's good to see some familiar names and faces on the Zoom tonight. So while we're waiting, I'll just go ahead and share a few upcoming programs um, that hopefully folks haven't already heard of. This will be a nice reminder. Uh, it's a busy week for the Land Trust. Uh, this Wednesday, 7 p.m., we're going to have Scott Edwards speak, and this is part of the On Belonging speaker series. Um, Scott Edwards is a professor of ornithology at Harvard University, um, and he's also going to be, so he'll be talking a little bit about his, his work and also um, a recent bike ride across the United States um, with a Black Lives Matter banner attached to his bike. Um, so really fascinating story. Um, and he'll don't have, don't have a lot of stories to share with us. And then on Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m., so that's March 3rd at 4 p.m., uh, John Calabria, a local naturalist who leads our wonderful noticing walks, is going to tell a springtime story, um, photos, videos, and experiences, and be available to answer questions and um, it's too bad we still got some snow on the ground, but we're starting to see some signs of spring. And I think Michelle will be sharing some nice ones as well. Uh, a couple other notes. Uh, this great collaboration that took place this spring with Codman Community Farms and Mothers Out Front Lincoln. Uh, we're doing a whole series focused on healthy soils and our regenerative um, gardening and farming and carbon sequestration. Uh, registration information is coming soon and the first program in that series will be a Zoom webinar on Tuesday, March 8, 7 p.m. Uh, all about uncovering soil and that'll be given by a local uh, Rachel Narath who is um, recently returned to Lincoln and she has a PhD in soil ecology. And then lastly, Michelle is going to give a few more details towards the end of her presentation, but we are reprising our wonderful and beloved in-person vernal pool exploration this spring, and that will be on April 23rd at 1 p.m., so you can save the date in the calendar. So I think with that, we're going to get started soon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm so pleased to have Michelle Gazenda here with us tonight. Michelle is the conservation director for the town of Lincoln. Um, and it's such a pleasure to work with her on an almost daily basis. Lots of emails flying back and forth between the uh, Lincoln Land Conservation Trust and town conservation um, these days. And um, she's a real expert. And we're so thrilled to have her with us tonight to talk about Lincoln's woodland fertile pools. Um, so Michelle, I'm going to stop sharing and turn the mic over to you. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Um, so I have a jam-packed slideshow tonight. Uh, and I promised Bryn I would try to keep it to 45 minutes. So we'll have some time for questions. Um, but I have so much to share. So I might talk a little fast and not get into too much uh, details, um, but there will be time for questions and 
I'm always available for calls or um, emails at my um, at my work in Lincoln Conservation Department. And we'll share that later. So, uh, Brenna, are you able to see my full screen? Awesome. Okay. So um, today's program is, is about everything awesome about vernal pools. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about what a vernal pool is, how to tell if you found one, the cool creatures that live in them, uh, the unfortunate threats we that uh, face vernal pools and their existence. Uh, also, we we'll want to talk a little bit about what you can do to help protect vernal pools um, in whatever town you live in, and seven tips to think about when you're visiting vernal pools. We'll finish with that. So we're going to start up. Um, if you went outside to your local conservation land, you would probably see something like this right now. Um, a little bit of snow on the ground. And if you are walking along the trails, you're gonna see some depressions where water is starting to sort of accumulate and you'll see these little icy ponds. And this is a great time of year to actually look for vernal pools because the groundwater is quite high and you'll see these uh, depressions that may have a little stream going in or out, but sometimes they're completely isolated and they're definitely not connected to a permanent year round flowing stream. Um, and then if it's summertime, the, so what's cool about this picture, by the way, is keep an eye on this uh, log in the front of the, of the vernal pool. And you'll see here in July, this is the same pool, same log, and it is bone dry. So one of the key features about vernal pools is they tend to dry out um, in the summer. And that's a critical uh, thing about vernal pools because one type of creature that does not live in vernal pools are fish. And obviously fish need year round water. So if the water body dries out in summer, that means there's no fish. And that is definitely a uh, possibility for a, a vernal pool. And I'm realizing there's a, a typo there and I apologize. Oh, another typo. Um, anyways, here is the same vernal pool in November um, filling up again. So a lot of times in the late fall, our vernal pools will start to fill up with water again. Um, and they might look pretty dormant and not a lot going on. But in fact, things are going on quite, quite a bit throughout the year. And we're going to talk about that. So the, why are vernal pools special compared to ponds? Okay, so there are specific, certain specific animals that only breed in vernal pools. And we're gonna talk about them first. We call those obligate vernal pool species. And uh, one of our sort of, you know, our, our famous vernal pool creature I think of is the spotted salamander. It has these beautiful yellow spots. Um, many of you have probably never seen a spotted salamander because they're nocturnal and they spend most of their life underground. And they come out of these little holes um, to feed at night in the forest, mostly. And then this time of year, in the next few weeks, um, they're actually gonna migrate back to the vernal pool where they came from to mate and lay eggs. Um, and they'll only spend a couple weeks actually at the vernal pool. So um, like I mentioned, in just a couple weeks, um, we're going to be looking for an evening that is at least 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to be raining and nighttime, um, and the ground has to be thawed a little bit. So we did have that crazy 70 degree weather um, last week, but things are still pretty cold underground. So fortunately, most of the amphibians stayed, <laughs> stayed hunkered down into their little burrows last week. But in the next few weeks when we have these these conditions again, we're going to have our salamanders come out of the forest um, and, and migrate many, many hundreds of feet um, back to their the vernal pool where they came from. And uh, on the left, you can see this is actually a picture of someone who's found some spotted salamanders crossing the road to get from their forest habitat to the vernal pool. And the, the right hand picture shows that you can actually still have snow on the ground and the salamanders are coming out to migrate. So not all the snow has to be gone in order for them to come out. And these particular nights, those first couple rainy nights in March or April, we call them kind of, we call them big night 
but it's really big nights. It doesn't just happen in one night. There's several nights where um, these types of animals are gonna be crossing roads if, if roads happen to exist between their uh, winter grounds and their breeding ground. And so here's an example of a picture, I should say, of sort of when the males uh, often come back first and they have a party <laughs> called a Congress in the vernal pool and they are swirling around and what they're doing, you might see these little white blobs on the ground. They're actually depositing little sperm packets called spermatophores. Um, and they deposit them on the ground of the vernal pool uh, for during this Congress. And I have a cool video I'm going to show, play a little bit. And what it's going to do is going to take us under the water so we can see what it's like to be a spotted salamander here. I think you can hear me too, but basically we're getting a, a, a salamander eyes view of them underwater. And then they have to surface to actually get air because they are air breathing. And this is something I've ne obviously never seen until I saw this video, which I thought was so cool. and back down where they're all hanging out together, which is so cool. Okay, so then what happens next? We have the males that came, they had their little Congress, and then the females arrive and they actually will, will pick up those spermatophores and they, they fertilize their eggs with internal fertilization. And um, several days after that moment, the Female spotted salamanders will lay a gelatinous blob. This is their egg mass. And there'll be between 30 and 250 little salamander larvae in each of these egg, egg masses. This egg mass is actually very close to hatching. You can see how there are, uh, there's actually, I can see a baby salamander almost ready to hatch in the middle there. You can see it's sort of turning green. This green is like an algae that ends up growing in the egg mass. And it's, uh, I think it actually helps to feed the salamanders um, right after they emerge. And it's, it's perfectly fine for it to be there. The, the egg mass itself when it's first laid is, is either whitish or clear. Um, but as it starts to mature before the larva hatch, it starts to turn that green color. And um, the, it'll take about, I think, six, about six weeks, um, or actually several weeks, I should say, uh, before the egg mass will hatch. Actually, I, I was right. It was six to eight weeks, and the, and the larva will hatch. And so here is a newly hatched salamander larva. One thing you'll notice that's different than a tadpole are these little frilly uh, appendages that kind of come out of the back of their head. These are external gills um, that help, that allow the salamander larva to breathe. Um, here it is next to a fingernail clam, which is another vernal pool um, mollusk that you, you may find if you look very closely at the ground of a, of a uh, vernal pool. And um, they start off about a half inch long and they'll become about two to three inches long as they metamorphose into an adult uh, salamander. And so this is many, many weeks later, a couple months after um, they've hatched and the salamander will actually reabsorb its external gills uh, because what's happening is lungs have developed inside the spotted salamander and it's breathing air. And by July, they are ready to emerge from the vernal pool where they become, you know, land breathing animals. Um, and this one, the specks on it don't look very well pronounced. Those yellow spots will develop as the animal grows. We do have another type of spotted salamander. However, this one is incredibly rare. It's actually um, listed 
um, by Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program in Massachusetts. This is a blue spotted salamander. And as you can see, it has blue spots. So we certainly wanna know if folks see any of those in Lincoln, or if you're not from Lincoln, make sure you um, definitely notify your conservation department if you find one of those. Um, we also have one frog that is an obligate vernal pool species. So meaning it only breeds in vernal pools. This is a wood frog. We can tell a wood frog from other frogs because it has this brown mask through its eyes. And here they are looking very brown, which is a typical color for them, but they can almost be like a brick reddish color, a salmon color. They can be a little bit grayer. Um, and they're about two inches, two and a half inches uh, long. They too, during these first rainy spring nights, will come out from their, um, from their, their wintering habitat, which is woodlands, just like the spotted salamander. And they're going to migrate back to their vernal pool where they came from. And um, they're going to also lay eggs in those vernal pools. The, the easiest way to tell a wood frog is right after big night happens when they are quacking a lot. And they, they're, they're quack, they're, their frog sound actually sounds like a quacking duck. And I'm gonna play a sample of it here after I turn down the volume a little bit. <laughs> I think it sounds a little bit like something's laughing, like laughing, laughing ducks maybe. Um, and they will, it will be so pervasive when they um, get to their vernal pools and you hear that sound. If you hear that sound, it's definitely a vernal pool. And what's really cool is those first, uh, right after the first couple of days after big night, you'll even hear that during the day. Um, and it's a really great sound to hear. So that's a, a really good tip if you're looking for vernal pools in the next several weeks to, to keep an ear out for that. So as I mentioned, the males and females will head over to the vernal pool where they came from and uh, their uh, reproduction is external fertilization where the, the male will often be grasping a female and the female will be laying her eggs and the male will be fertilizing them as she's laying the egg. And I had to look up this fact twice today because I can't believe this, but their, their egg mass, one of these egg mass blobs can consist up to 1,500, 1,500 individual eggs, which seems like a crazy number. Um, and it's good that they lay so many eggs because there's a lot of, of course, things that like to eat tadpoles. And oftentimes after big night, you might even have another freeze. And these, these eggs are attached, both salamander and frogs attach their eggs usually to stems under the water, um, but they sometimes float to the surface and those surface eggs might freeze and die. Um, but when you have a whole bunch of eggs under the water, hopefully many most will survive. Also, sometimes a vernal pool might dry out in the springtime before the eggs can emerge. Um, and so having so many eggs at once, the hope is at least many will survive at least to tadpole into froglet age. So here's a picture of a newly hatched tadpoles. Um, the larva hatch about a month, 28 days after they were laid. Again, that um, egg mass does turn very green from algae and um, they actually will feed on that algae when they first emerge. And they basically just look like these very dark little large head and tail creatures in the vernal pool. But it won't take long before they start to get larger and larger um, over several weeks. Um, and eventually they start off, um, well, after a few weeks, they get this gold flecking and a quite a big head. You'll see this little, there's a little black um, tadpole under it. And this is actually an American toad. Uh, American toads breed after wood frogs. So eventually the little toad will, will be the same size practically, but um, they're just, they, they, the wood frog started, started earlier. And then several weeks later, the wood frog, all tadpoles, will start to grow legs, back legs, front legs, 
the tail will start to be reabsorbed into its body. And then, um, you know, a couple months after uh, they emerge or they hatch, I should say, you'll start to have these emerged froglets showing up around vernal pools. Um, and sometimes they still have a little tail nub left to them. So we have one more obligate vernal pool species, animals that only um, are found in vernal pools. And this is an invertebrate, we call it a fairy shrimp. This makes it look like a monster the size of this picture. Um, but they are, they actually swim upside down. Um, and what's this picture here on the bottom, it actually shows the egg, the egg, not the egg mass, but sort of the fairy shrimp is holding an egg sac that it will eventually deposit those eggs on the ground of a vernal pool. And fairy shrimp are probably already active now in vernal pools. They, they emerge, or I should say they hatch sort of in the winter months and they grow very slowly in cold, cold water. Um, but then in March, they become very active in April. And usually by the, um, the end of April or even in early May, they will die off, the adults die off, but the, the eggs they lay in the bottom stay dormant for many, many months. And, and they even go through a drying phase. These eggs can totally dry out. And then next winter, the eggs will hatch and they will slowly start to grow. So it's kind of a cool thing to know is in a vernal pool. Um, here's a picture of a fairy shrimp I took years ago when I um, netted a few and I put them in a container with water to take some photographs uh, for vernal pool certification that we'll get into later. Here's a cool video you're gonna see of Right now you're seeing the still life of mosquito larva, also often found in vernal pools and ponds. Um, but what you're gonna see come up on the screen are some fairy shrimp uh, swimming through the water. And most of these I believe are pregnant females. So look for that egg mass just under its, its gills and its uh, leg appendages. So they look like they're swimming underwater and they're absolutely gorgeous. They're about an inch long. I mean, they start off tiny. But before they die, they get to about an inch long. And they're difficult to see in a vernal pool because of course vernal pools are very dark colored. The water's dark, um, but you can sometimes just sit next to a vernal pool and look into the water very carefully in the sunny spot and you can see them. Okay, so those were our, our animals that only breed or only live in vernal pools. Now we're going to talk about several, mostly amphibians, that often are found in vernal pools um, or sometimes found in vernal pools, but they can also be found in ponds. So if you hear or see these animals, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a vernal pool you're at, but um, they could be, and they're cool. So we're going to go through them. <laughs> this is a spring peeper, which again looks like a mammoth. These guys are the size of like your thumbnail. They're super tiny as adults. They're a type of tree frog. Um, I have never um, been able to find them in the water. They're so tiny and I just think, I mean, I've, I've stood next to a vernal pool or pond staring, hearing them like calling all around me and I just cannot find these guys in the water. But um, on, on vernal pool big nights, on big nights, rainy nights, I will see them crossing roads. And unfortunately they're so tiny that it's really hard to see them unless you're, you know, stop still looking with a very bright flashlight. Um, they're very, very tiny. Um, however, we probably all hear them. This is sort of your quintessential, you know, early summer, late spring um, sound you hear from a lot of our wetlands in Lincoln and other towns. So I'll play first um, a, a lone spring peeper, which you very rarely hear it by itself. Make sure I'm not going to Oh yeah, let me turn that down a little bit for you. Whoops. So that was actually a chorus of spring peepers. That wasn't a lone one. That's our typical sound we hear when we're just listening near a pond or a wetland in early spring. I'm not sure what happened to my lone spring peeper. I can try that again. Oh yeah.
So that's our lone spring peeper. But again, usually we hear that loud chorus of them. Whoa. Sorry about that, <laughs> that was loud. <laughs> Pretend you're just right by a pond edge right there in early June, that's what you're hearing. Um, another very uh, common toad or frog that we have in Massachusetts that can be found in vernal pools, but also in our ponds is the American toad. And they, um, those will start to breed a little bit later than the wood frog. And if you look closely in this picture, this is again, the mating toads, you will see they lay a string of eggs. So not an egg mass like our wood frog, but a string, a chain of these black eggs is the American toads um, st strand of eggs and I'll play it sound. And that too, that sound just reminds me of like a warm May day when you just hear this trill during the day from the distance. And it could be um, toads that are, they can breed in like intermittent streams um, or ponds, also vernal pools. It's such a lovely sound to hear. And then this is American tree frog. I actually took this picture um, in Lincoln um, and it was, I was coming home late at night and there's this tree frog on um, the driveway that fortunately I saw. I put him on, or her, I think this is a him because that yellow spot on his foot, um, on a tree and it almost instantly blended in. It was hard to even see. Um, and tree frogs are one of these awesome sounds you hear all summer actually. Uh, they kind of sound like a, a bird and I have been confused early on. I was perplexed by the mystery bird sounds I would hear um, at night and it turned out to be this tree frog. And I hear that sound and I just, I just think of like a hot sweltering summer night, um, hearing that in like Lincoln, if you're in a wooded area, um, just a lovely sound. They too are very difficult to see uh, in ponds or vernal pools. Uh, I will see them though during, during the summer from time to time. Um, they love to sort of make a little crevice to themselves like under your air conditioner unit or something that you sometimes find. Um, Throughout, throughout the summer months. Uh, and they're just such a lovely, they're pretty big. They're like two inches, two and a half inches uh, large. And two more frogs that are more um, typical of ponds, because these need more permanent water, um, are green frog and bullfrog. So both of these frogs produce tadpoles, but these tadpoles overwinter as a tadpole. So they need a, a pond or almost like a permanent vernal pool. Some vernal pools don't dry up entirely every year. So you could have like a semi-permanent vernal pool that may have like a green frog in it. Um, and they, they will, they overwinter as a tadpole and then they become an adult the following year. They look very similar to each other. In general, bullfrogs are much larger than green frogs, but bullfrogs have to start small too. So they overlap in size. The key to look for is on this green frog, it has um, the, what they call the dorsolateral ridge. This, this like ridge on its back starts from the back of its eye and goes all the way down its back. Um, green frogs have that ridge, whereas bullfrogs have a very smooth back. There's no ridge. They've got those bony parts, but, but no actual ridge. The ridge, actually curves around their ear right here. So that is the key thing to look for. If the ridge extends on the back, it's a green frog. Um, if it does not, it's a bullfrog. Um, both bullfrogs and green frogs can somewhat overlap in color. So don't necessarily confuse the brown green frog and the green bullfrog as being identifying features in this picture. Their sounds are very different too. So they're, those, and these are great to, to learn and listen for because um, they're just very vocal frogs. We're gonna start with the green frog.
there's there's a lot singing there so um when it's just a single one it's a little bit easier to tell um it almost sounds like you're stringing a, a guitar string or something and then the bullfrog has this very uh, slightly lower drum 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 <laughs> They just sound like a big, deep sounding frog. So our bullfrog has that deeper voice. Uh, and then moving on from our frogs, we've got some reptiles that often visit vernal pools. They can, they can be found in ponds as well. So we have spotted turtles on the left with the characteristic yellow spots on them. Um, and much more common is our peanut turtles on the right. Those you'll often see setting themselves on um, logs in both ponds and sometimes vernal pools. And we can't forget about the little creatures. Here's a video from Matt Byrne, who um, is gonna be helping lead the vernal pool walk in April. And I'm gonna play this. The, all the gray sort of blurry blobs all around are Daphnia, but what's really cool if you look closely at this picture is you're gonna see fairy shrimp all through this too, which kind of blend in. I actually watched this like three times before I saw the fairy shrimp. But you can kind of see the little fairy shrimp swimming around. Their white tails are kind of very obvious, um, which is that obligate vernal pool species. The Daphne are not an obligate vernal pool species. But what's cool about this picture is just the, the realization that there is so much going on in the vernal pools, um, particularly in the spring and summer months, but really all year. And so here are some of our typical uh, invertebrates that are found in vernal pools. They are also found in other more permanent ponds um, as well. So these are not only found in vernal pools, but they're very cool creatures. The left side caddisfly larva, they're actually these little creatures inside these cases. They make these cases by um, pulling apart brand little branches and twigs and grass and they sort of stick them on the, each on themselves to form a little home. Um, one's called like the log cabin caddisfly because it makes a little log cabin. This one's using little leaf parts, which is so cool. And then on the right, we've got a dragonfly larva on the upper right. And of course, we all know what a beautiful adult dragonfly looks like, but the larva uh, we might not be as familiar with. And lower right is the fingernail clams um, and snails that often are found in vernal pools. Then we've got some, uh, I kind of think of the, the predator of the, uh, the insect predator of the vernal pool, the predaceous uh, water beetle. And um, we also have a giant water bug on the bottom. But so the predaceous water beetle at the top will often um, eat things like tadpoles. Um, and other creatures in the vernal pool itself. And speaking of eating things in vernal pools, there's a lot of different waterfowl and birds that will visit vernal pools and, and feed on some of the invertebrates and the egg masses and the tadpoles. So we've got a, a wood duck, actually a pair, females quite camouflage on the upper left. We have a solitary sandpiper on the right, and then deer, which of course are found everywhere, but they'll also visit our vernal pools, um, especially in the summer as you get this new growth of grass, um, which is um, quite nutritious for them. So that was all the exciting things about vernal pools. Now, unfortunately, we need to talk about some of the threats to vernal pools in the wildlife. Um, one of the biggest threats to vernal pools is development. Um, oftentimes, uh, the, there'll be lots of beautiful uplands surrounding our vernal pools, and those upland areas make great places for subdivisions and houses. And so development is probably one of the biggest threats to our vernal pool systems. And that can take place in a lot of different ways. So sometimes the vernal pool itself will remain here in the front. It was a vernal pool that unfortunately during development um, was converted almost to this detention basin or, or stormwater basin. Um, and it drains, it doesn't hold water as long as it needs to to function as a vernal pool anymore. Um, and so although it's a, a pretty little wet meadow, the vernal pool characteristics have, um, have been lost in this particular picture. Um, sometimes, again, the vernal pool might be protected, but that buffer zone, that upland buffer zone around it may be uh, constructed on. And again, some of these creatures are moving like a thousand feet 
away from the vernal pool to live most of their year. So if you end up destroying the upland buffer zone around the vernal pools, you're essentially removing all the habitat these creatures need to survive. We talked a little bit about detention basins. So with big subdivisions, you have to maintain, manage the stormwater. And so oftentimes you'll see these big retention or detention basins built um, at big box stores and subdivisions now. And unfortunately, it looks like a vernal pool to a lot of animals. And this was a, a detention basin I monitored during construction many years ago in Framingham. And after a rainy evening, the toads all came out and started breeding in it. And unfortunately, this thing doesn't hold water long. It actually is meant to drain, to infiltrate the water after a few days. Um, and so all of these tadpole, all these um, toad eggs ended up drying up and not surviving. And so these then, you know, the, the, to the toads and the frogs get confused and they don't know the difference. When they see a body of water in spring, they think it's a vernal pool or a, you know, a pond that they can lay eggs and it's not successful, unfortunately. Another huge issue, of course, is roads. We talked briefly about, there's actually three issues with roads. <laughs> Um, one is it often crosses our landscape and these animals are coming from a long distance so they have to cross roads. So cars are a huge problem. These are little tiny creatures and even with headlights on, you just can't see them. Um, also curbs, uh, I never really thought about a granite curb. I always thought granite curbs were lovely, I should say, until I thought about how many frogs or sa particularly salamanders start crossing a road and get stuck by the curb. That's like, that's like a retaining wall to them and they can't get over the curb. So what do they do? They follow the curb and then it's, think about it, a pouring rain night, you've got this little stream along the edge of the curb and a lot of these um, end up in a catch basin. And this is just a whole, this is just like a piping system. They get, they get stuck into this catch basin. Sometimes the pipe would, if the water's flowing fast, will eventually take them somewhere, but where it's gonna take them is often those detention basins, uh, which end up not being vernal pools or, or friendly for breeding. Um, so you have sort of a triple whammy of badness when it comes to roads, unfortunately. So what can you do? Um, there's a lot that we can do to help protect our vernal pools. And I feel so grateful to have lived 13 years in Lincoln and sat on the open space committee and now work for the town of Lincoln and know that Lincoln has done such a phenomenal job to protect open space in, in, in their town. About 40% of the town is protected. And I would say the number one thing you can do to help protect vernal pools is ultimately support open space protection. Because when we have unfragmented forests and wetlands and vernal pools without roads or houses around it, that is the best thing we can do to try to protect the frogs and salamanders that need them. And organizations like Lincoln Land Conservation Trust have done such an amazing job to protect a patchwork of beautiful open space in town. And so we should applaud those efforts, the folks in, in Lincoln who um, past and present, who are continually trying to protect more land. That is the utmost thing that you can do um, to support your land trust in protecting open space. Other than that, you can absolutely be an advocate for your neighborhood. You know, if you hear about development happening, if you get in a butter notification and you know of a vernal pool, you wanna, you wanna let municipal officials know about that um, and uh, make sure that they understand that these are, there are vernal pools. Fortunately, Lincoln has a pretty strict wetlands bylaw. So we can protect up to hundred feet around vernal pools. There's not much we can do besides beyond that hundred feet, which brings that open space protection so important. Some towns create wildlife tunnels um, that help animals cross the road safely. They're very expensive, but even um, in Lincoln and Concord, uh, the recent Route 2 expan expansion, uh, or I should say redevelopment a few years ago, created um, some wildlife tunnels. <laughs> um, I don't know if amphibians use them, but certainly other larger wildlife uses them. And remember we talked about curbs. You know, when we do plan for development, we should be thinking about Cape Cod berms or, short, or smaller berms so that any amphibians that are getting onto a road can get off of it. Um, so even thinking about your, your property and what kind of barriers you put to wildlife is important to kind of factor in and consider some alternatives. Um, certifying vernal pools is a great way of figuring out where vernal pools exist in your town and making sure that officials know where they are as well. And so uh, the Massachusetts 
Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program has a great website on that. I won't get into details now, but I, I am hoping to start certifying some more pools in Lincoln. Um, and uh, you can, you're welcome to send me some information if you know some vernal pools. Uh, how to find them, uh, oftentimes you can just find them looking, you know, walking through the woods like we talked about in the different seasons and looking for these sort of depressions holding water. Uh, but we do have some great GIS maps. Every town, uh, often, well, I shouldn't say every, but I think most towns around here do have some type of GIS map on your municipal website. Uh, Lincoln does for sure. And what you end up doing here is you get onto the Town of Lincoln GIS website, you click on layers, uh, you click on conservation habitat, and you check off certified vernal pools and potential vernal pools. And voila, you end up seeing all of these pink and maybe maroon colored dots, which are the certified and potential pools. I did find out this, this layer is a little bit wonky. I don't know why. So if you are thinking of certifying a pool near you, you you're welcome to call me first and we can chat about it. You can zoom in by hitting that plus feature on the top, top right. Um, regardless if you're in Lincoln or another town, um, you can also find these same layers by the Massachusetts GIS site called Mass Mapper. And so you can, um, it's a little bit, uh, once you play around with it a couple of times, it's more easier, but you click on conservation recreation, you click on certified vernal pools and, and also potential vernal pools, you make sure they come down to the lower right, and then the blue dots and blue stars will show up in whatever town you live in. And these are just, a, a potential vernal pools are just an aerial photo that somebody looked at um, and sort of made note of which ones might be um, vernal pools based on the color um, so maybe seeing water um, standing on the surface from, a, from an aerial distance. And a lot of that was actually done by Matt Byrne many, many years ago when he was the vernal pool ecologist for the state. Here's just a zoomed in portion of that same mass mapper, which is it's kind of fun to play with. And here you can see uh, the stars are certified vernal pools. So even just looking at the sandy well, Flint pond area, you can see a number of certified vernal pools uh, just east of Bedford Road, and you've got, you know, one over near Route 2 that shows here. But look at all these potential vernal pools that have not been certified. Certifying vernal pools, there is a very specific methodology for, for doing it. I won't have time to go into it today, but showing a lot of its photographic evidence of a pool holding water, reading evidence of those obligate vernal pool species, a map and sketch, and some additional information on a data form. You submit all of that um, to this online observation form called the Vernal Pool Certification Report. This is on the Natural Heritage Endangered Species website. And it takes you through a very simplified um, process to, to uh, record information that's needed. And, and over a several month period, um, staff at Natural Heritage will, will review the material and hopefully certify your pool. And it will notify the town when you do that. Some other things you can do here is um, uh, try to help salamanders on these big nights. So in Lincoln, we've had a tradition of putting up some warning signs um, uh, around big night time uh, along several roads where we know there's a lot of crossings. We don't do this at every place. We just do this at a couple um, streets in town to warn uh, vehicles that there are frogs and salamanders crossing. So if you do see those signs out, um, on a rainy night, you, you want to avoid those areas at all costs. Um, the other thing you can do is just stay inside on rainy nights and tell your friends to stay inside on rainy nights. That's literally the best thing you can do because there's so much mortality of these creatures um, from, from these rainy nights. But if you do want to go out and you do want to try to help some of the salamanders or frogs cross the road, we are, Lincoln Land Trust and Conservation Department are collecting names of folks that are interested in participating. And so uh, we'll put in the chat, and maybe Brynn's already done that, um, the big uh, application form that you can sign up so we can get your information and send you some, some more information on how you can help. And we'll be sending out email blasts when we think Big Night's going to happen. All right, lastly, I've got seven quick slides because I don't want to forget some very important things that you should know if you do get excited about visiting Vernal Pools. Um, please ask permission if you are venturing off your property, even if you're visiting conservation land, we like to know if someone's gonna be checking it out to certify it. Give LLCT or conservation department a call. If the property is on, pri on a private property, you, you really should be asking permission before accessing that land. 
um, know how to dress and pack properly. It's cold, it's wet. Um, you know, if you're going to try to document species, you need a net, you need a bucket. So think about what you need to bring in order to um, collect the information or to, to observe the information that you're trying to certify. Uh, watch out for poison ivy ticks and sticks. Um, <laughs> we all love open space, but there are some hazards out there. So making sure that um, you protect yourself from that. Um, and, but with poison, with ticks, you know, a lot of times we want to put spray, bug spray on. We absolutely don't want to put bug spray on our hands or things that when we're touching animals. That's also true for big night migration. Thinking about going out and trying to bring salamanders across the road. If we have hand sanitizer or, or hand cream on our hands, that can, that can impact the amphibians. So you want to keep your hands clean of chemicals. Uh, be careful with the animals, whether you're walking on a road on a rainy night or visiting a rural pool, these things are tiny um, and they could be under leaf litter. You wouldn't even know they're under leaf litter. So be very, very careful if you're approaching a vernal pool um, and, and, and don't damage these eggs. These eggs are incredibly uh, loose. They're incredibly um, able to just kind of follow sticks and branches and then you, you may end up making them all, you know, unable to hatch. So, so really leave things where they are and try to take pictures without disturbing them. But take the pictures, <laughs> definitely photo document when you see stuff. And you can email me or stop by the conservation office if you see some cool things that you took pictures of. Uh, lastly, leave everything there. We want to be very careful not to really disturb these animals. So take pictures, take photographs, leave everything else. Um, even if you're out on big night moving some salamanders and you're concerned there's a car coming, absolutely pick that animal up, bring it to the side of the road where it is moving, even if it seems like it's going in the wrong direction, if it's headed in a certain direction, it wants to go in that way, and you want to move it, um, because you could also be seeing it after big night, you know, after they breed, lay their eggs, they're, they're going to, on another night, migrate the other direction. So wherever you see them facing, you want to bring them to that area, but you do not want to put them in a bucket. You don't want to put them in a jar. You want to just carefully put them um, beyond the side of the road where hopefully there's a safe place for them. And my last slide, um, there's so many great vernal pool resources out there. This is my favorite book, the a Field Guide to Animals of Vernal Pools uh, with her um, name Leo Kenny had put this together. It's a lovely book. Um, do check it out. You can still get it at various places. There's great information from the Vernal Pool Association, which I, is where I got most of these pictures tonight. There's such great educational information there. The state has a Vernal Pool certification site to know about and the same date, of course, for our Lincoln Vernal Pool field trip that Bryn mentioned briefly. Um, she'll be providing more information about that in, in the upcoming week or two. And thank you, thank you for wanting to learn about vernal pools and thank you for doing what you can to help protect them in Lincoln and whatever town that you live in. Thank you, Michelle, that was fantastic. Love the, the videos, especially that, that was so cool to see them swimming underwater. Um, so we do have a couple questions. Um, so we'll do those first and then if we have time, we'll um, invite folks to um, use the raise hand feature if they'd like to, to ask an additional question. Um, so Michelle had a question, does the bylaw protect only certified vernal pools or does it protect um, potential vernal pools as well? It can protect potential vernal pools, especially if we find out they are vernal pools during the process. So I, I should say even, let me step back, even isolated, isolated wetlands that are not vernal pools are protected under um, the local wetlands bylaw, any size isolated wetlands. Um, however, if we find out it is a vernal pool, um, that 100 foot upland buffer zone resource area has much stricter standards, performance standards for work in it. Um, whereas if it was just an isolated wetland that wasn't known to be a vernal pool, there might be a little bit more leniency on what could happen on portions of that, vernal, of that buffer zone. So certifying the vernal pool or at least even taking pictures of the creatures that are visiting it, um, you know, if it's certifiable, that also is very important. Great, that's good to know. Um, question from Marilyn, about how long do the peepers go for? Yeah, they, they go for a, a much longer than the wood frogs. So, you know, they're gonna start up sort of, I would say like mid April. And I think I hear them through all of May. 
maybe early June. It's one of those things I always say to myself every summer, like, when do I stop hearing peepers? But I, I think they can go, you know, even into like early June. So they, they do go for a couple months. Great. Um, those were all of our written questions. Um, so we'll just give folks another minute or two. They're typing. What I'll do too, while we're waiting, I have another cool video I can quickly show. Um, that was really fun that I saw. Are you seeing my full screen again? Yeah. Okay, so I found this video that I wasn't sure I was gonna have time for, but you, I'll just play this as people think of potentially other questions to ask. But, you know, I see this picture and I'm like, this is what it must be like to be a spotted salamander on the ground. So think about how they have to move so far through the woods um, to get to these vernal pools on a rainy, cold night. I mean, look at that. It's like pouring spotted salamanders. It's hard to believe there's that many there. And then they finally make it to the vernal pool. They're having a little congress. And unfortunately, you can only see these at night. You won't be able to see this during the day. I mean, every once in a while, or like a sunrise walk through the woods, you know, see a vernal pool in the springtime and look in, I'll see a couple salamanders. So I'll stop that again. A couple more questions came in. Um, do salamanders make a sound the way the frogs do? That's a great question. They do not. I don't, I don't think they really make any sound. Yeah, I know. And do you know the status of that pond at Pierce House, if it's a vernal pool? Yeah, I think the, the main pond there, I believe, I would be shocked if it doesn't have fish because it, it does hold water, you know, most years, I think. I mean, even though it has dried up and it's getting pretty filled in with cattails and other vegetation, I would suspect that it holds too much water for it to fully dry out and that it probably doesn't function as a vernal pool, but we should all take a look at it this spring and see if we hear any wood frogs uh, quacking in that area. Yeah, it's a great idea. Have someone go out on a nice cold, right. cold dark night, see if anyone's um, visiting. Um, question, which I think you, you maybe partially answered already, um, but can we expect to see salamanders um, on any wet night in March or April, or is it really just the first few ones? Yeah, so generally it is it is kind of focused on just a couple of those first rainy nights um, in March or April um, is when you see the majority of them. And again, it's not every road, it's, it's just where there happens to be a vernal pool near a road that is where these crossings happen. And however, then they do have to come back to the forest after they meet and, and lay eggs. So then a few weeks later, you'll start to see a migration going the opposite direction. And that is less of a, um, of a big migration. It's sort of, they trickle back. And so there will be several weeks where you could, you could see um, salamanders, frogs crossing. I should also note too, then later rainy evenings, in May and even June, you'll find other frogs. You'll find a green frog, you'll find bullfrogs. You might see toads or gray tree frogs. So they'll cross also on rainy nights. So rainy nights are, you should always be on the lookout for amphibians crossing the roads, but they're, that mass migration of the wood frogs and salamanders happen on those first rainy nights in spring. That's great. Uh, uh, another, another question from Christine. Um, are you going to post or give any sort of alert as to when Big Night may be this year? Yeah, I'm still 14 with It's a great question. You know, this is my, I've been in Lincoln just a year now. I'm trying to figure out how much information to give folks. Um, well, certainly, if you're interested, um, you could sign up for uh, that Big Night volunteer, and that's, I'll be sending email blasts when we think there might be a big night happening. I will be putting some information on Lincoln Talk um, and my, we have a conservation coffee email listserv as well. So if you're not on that, you're welcome to email me. Uh, do we put on that just the conservation coffee listserv? I put out a monthly email and then probably for big night, 
I'll be sending out a couple more email blasts just so people know so they can decide like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to stay home and not drive or, you know, oh, I do live near, you know, a place where I've seen founders and I go out and try to try to look for them. Obviously safety is super important. So if you do go out, it's absolutely essential. You have, you know, some type of reflective vest, you've got, you've got lights, you've got very bright lights um, and you absolutely have to be careful because cars, unfortunately, um, <laughs> drive oftentimes very fast and you just, it, they're unpredictable. We'll wait another minute for any, any last thoughts or questions. Lots of nice, lots of nice comments for you, Michelle, in the chat. Thank you. There, I should mention for any Vernal Pool enthusiasts out there, there is a Vernal Pool listserv that I think is, um, Sort of run by the Vernal Pool Association, and they, although you know, be forewarned, unless you go on Daily Digest, <laughs> you'll get like you know up to ten or twenty emails a day. Sometimes it's a whole bunch of people who absolutely adore Vernal Pools, and you know, ask questions or we talk. They talk about Big Night, um, and a lot of times you, I mean, even though it sounds so simple, oh, about forty degrees and raining. I mean, we've actually had a couple of those nights already, and we didn't actually have Big Night. So it is. It's very localized. Um, there are times where I thought for sure we're going to have an awesome big night and, you know, it was raining, it was like perfect conditions and you go out and you just don't see much. So it's one of those very thing, difficult um, events to predict, it certainly can't plan. Um, and that's what kind of makes it exciting and what makes it so fun, what makes nature so fun is to have this kind of like special moment happening, this magic happening every spring. I see someone wrote about particular plants that are associated with vernal pools. Not really. Um, you know, again, the, a lot of the, the plants that are growing at the bottom of a vernal pool are um, wetland plants because they have to tolerate being inundated for several months out of the year. And then the, you know, the edges might just be your typical, you know, oaks and maples and viburnums. Um, so it can, they can vary quite a bit what, what kind of plants grow in vernal pools. And they, um, and LLCT will be sending out information about the Vernal Pool field trip, I believe, shortly on, as long as you're on their email list, which is another great uh, list to be on. Yeah, so we'll be sending information out probably in a few weeks. It's April still a ways off, you know, it doesn't feel like that sometimes. <laughs> And I'm just, um, I'm just, you've seen my email before, conservation at lincolntown.org. I've just entered that into the chat as well. So if people have questions about vernal pools or you have trouble finding one of the resources I shared tonight, uh, feel free to email me. I think Bryn, I'll be sending Bryn some follow-up resources and info that she'll be sending out to everyone who registered tonight within a couple of days. So you'll be getting a little, um, list of resources um, that I'll provide her shortly. That's right. And we'll also include this recording. So if you wanted to rewatch any of the videos or look at the pictures, find the fairy shrimp in the video <laughs> again. Well, thank you, Michelle. This is really wonderful. Um, and I think you really nailed it that it's such a special uh, habitat and we're really lucky to have so many of them in Lincoln. Um, Thank you very much and have a great night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, and hope you enjoy a wonderful spring and help save the salamanders and frogs. <laughs>